anybody tell me which business is notorious for an increase in membership in the month of January? Does anybody know this answer? Nobody knows. Gym memberships in the month of January are notorious for an increase in membership. Can anybody tell me why that would be? Amy. Because you get it yearly. Yearly, um, Not necessarily. Yeah. I can sign up for gym membership whenever I want. Why Dafka January? Chucky. New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions. We all have them, right? We get to a new date in the calendar year. It makes us feel something. And so we decide to act on it. Good. I want to give you some statistics about gym memberships. Statistic number one. Within the first three months, 80% of people who sign up for gym membership in the month of January quit. Statistic number two. Only 18% of people actually use their gym membership when they sign up in the month of January. Statistic number three. Owners are aware of what is going on, what continuously happens year after year. In order for owners to be profitable with their gym, they require 10 times of the amount of people than capacity. They are willing to open up a business knowing that if at capacity they won't be successful, knowing that they will get more memberships than they can actually withstand. It's pretty crazy. Four months ago, we had our own version of New Year's resolutions. Right? We had Rosh Hashanah, we had Yom Kippur. And I'm sure every single person, including myself, made commitments. We made vows. We said things to ourselves. We said things to God. There were things that made us upset about who we are and how we are. And we made commitments to change. Now I'm not going to ask anybody to answer this question honestly. I just want you to think about it in your head because I don't want to embarrass anybody, including myself. How many of us in this room are still committed to the change that we prescribe for ourselves during the high holiday times? If statistics are accurate, which they are, 80% of us in this room are no longer doing things or saying things that we were saying and doing four months ago when it mattered most, when it was crunch time, when we were up against the clock, when God gave us an opportunity to repent, when God gave us an opportunity to reflect about our lives, and so we had all of this emotion that was being pressed against us, yeah, we said we would do everything and anything. We would sign up for the gym. We would change our speech. We would change certain behaviors. But 80% of us in this room most likely are not doing the things that we once upon a time wished upon ourselves. And so knowing that this is human nature, knowing that this is part of who we are as human beings, Question is, what do we do? How do we flip the script? How do we avoid just being another statistic? And in order to ask, answer that question, I want to ask a question. Does anybody in this room know what the most expensive baseball card is to date in American history? What is the most expensive baseball card on the market? Babe Ruth, 1934. Incorrect. Norman. I don't know why. I don't know who it is, but the reason it's because he didn't like it. So it was rare. Okay. So, good thought. Somewhat accurate. Alan, last guess? Incorrect. Between 1909 and 1911, Ezra's mouthing it to me, the American Tobacco Company 
produced baseball cards as an opportunity to grow business. They felt that if children were exposed to their brand, they'd grow up smoking cigarettes. Honus Wagner, one of the greatest baseball players of all time, shortstop for the Pittsburgh Pirates, was adamant that his card could not be manufactured and sold because he was against the business efforts of the American Tobacco Company. He didn't want to feel responsible for young children being exposed to tobacco. So only 200 of his cards were ever produced. If you wanted to buy a Honus Wagner 1909 T206 baseball card, at the time, or at least in the 1930s, it was worth $50, which was a lot of money back in the 1930s. To date, can anybody guess how much a Honus Wagner baseball card was just sold last year? Give me a number. How much? Thirty million dollars. Okay, that's outstanding. No. Fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. No. Seventy-five thousand. Seventy-five thousand. No. Two hundred k. Keep going. One and a half million. Keep going. Three point five million. A little bit less. Two point eight million dollars. At once upon a time, one of them, uh, one of these cards that is being circulated, it was owned by the one Wayne Gretzky, right? He's one of the owners. At this point, I forgot the guy's name, but the owner of the Arizona Diamondbacks, he's the guy who now owns one of these very most popular, very rare, Honus Wagner baseball cards. And the question is, boys, who can answer for me, what made this particular card as valuable as it was, why is it so expensive? What makes it so special, this Honus Wagner card? Two ingredients. Michael. It's rare, there's only 200 of them that were ever manufactured, and I'm guessing, right, that there's only one or two, I don't know how many are, are around that are actually the same condition, right, as it once was manufactured. What else? The reason why, so. Why, why is it so expensive? Because he was, so we said it, it's rare. Nobody had no, no access to it. Um, okay, so that's why it was rare, Freddie. Because he made his cards not just an average cards. He made his card a special card. So anytime you can ever answer with either using the words average or special, question chances are you'll get the right answer. Uh, they happen to be right, but in the wrong context. Honus Wagner was one of the greatest players to ever play the game. He was a special dude. So when you add two secret ingredients of rarity and special, you get from $50 to $2.8 million. Let's recognize something, boys. Let's be real amongst the boys right now. We are all going on vacation. And on vacation, we want to relax, we want to veg, we feel like the school's been working us way too hard, all these planners, minyan in the morning, hajj, we deserve a break, it's time for us to just chill. Now, I don't want anybody to confuse what I'm about to say, so I'm going to give a disclaimer. You have been working very hard, and you do deserve a break. We all do. So you should spend extra time with your family, and you should maybe wake up a little bit later than you're used to waking up, and you should enjoy quality time, just having an opportunity to relax. However, The average Joe in your circumstances will totally disregard what it is that makes them valuable. We live a life of values, and there are things that we do here 
every single day in school that in my opinion should not be up for negotiation in terms of do we do these things, do we continue to do these things or not. And I'll give a few examples. Number one, tefillah. We pray every day. If there's a minyan accessible at wherever uh, destination you may find yourselves in. Number two, exercise. I can't even begin to tell you how many of you punks come back from winter vacation gasping for breath every single time I have a practice the second vacation's over. Right? You're just chilling and vegging on the beach. Nobody wants to move a muscle. Number three, reading. It is very important to keep on reading. We don't take a break from stimulating ourselves intellectually. And I'm sure that there are others. I wanted to focus on just three, but here is what I'm prescribing. There is a reason why 80% of people who sign up for gym memberships within the first three months end up being quitters. You want to know why that happens? It's because they don't stay with the consistent values that can drive their lives forward. You know what they say? They say, I'm overweight. So instead of eating everything, I'm going to eat nothing. And then all of a sudden, three weeks later, we realize we're really, really hungry. And I can't keep up with this anymore. And so I go back and I eat everything and anything that I want to eat. Before January 1st, I never worked out a day in my life. You know, we said, I'm going to go to the gym every day for three hours a day. All of a sudden, I'm so tired. I can't move. This is nonsense. I can't do this anymore. Goodbye. I'm done. And we become so extreme. Being successful is not about being extreme. Being successful is about taking the little things in life that you do well and continuously doing them over and over and over again. That's how we become successful in life. And so boys, on vacation, you will be tested. You know what the test is? It's exactly what you're experiencing right now. Four months after the high holidays, who's still doing what they committed to do back when they felt they needed to say and do certain things? Right? We told God, I'm never going to do this anymore. I'm done with this. Or I'm never going to speak like this anymore. I'm done with that. We said all these things because we realized that it wasn't helpful or it wasn't conducive to the way we wanted to live our lives. Hey, let's be real. Vacation time is a time in which we will fall into those traps. We're going to be on the beach at 6 o'clock maybe. Ads, I don't want to get up. I don't want to go to I don't want to pray. I don't want to do. I don't want to, right? Or we're going to be wherever we are. Hajj, I don't want to wake up and pray in the morning. I'll wake up at 12 o'clock, I'll pray in hot double, right? We'll, we'll justify all these things to ourselves. Boys, here is the question. You want to be average or you want to be special? You want to be average so we can all sit here and we can be another statistic and we can be amongst the 80% of people who quit after three months of being in the gym. You want to be special? Understand the values that drive your lives. Understand that it's about consistency and it's about understanding your identity. Even when you're on vacation, we never quit being special. We can relax, we can enjoy. Three things we're gonna focus on as a collective unit. We're gonna pray, we're gonna exercise, and we're gonna read. And if we can do those things, those three things, then we can show to ourselves that we are not just a statistic. It doesn't matter if it's Rosh Hashanah time, or if it's summer time, or if it's winter time. I don't care who we are. I don't care where we are. We play our way. Everybody, let's have a meaningful, enjoyable experience as we take a break from vacation. However, let's not forget who we are. We are special people on a journey towards championship caliber dreams. We're going to pray, we're going to exercise, and we're going to read. And if we can do those things, we can do anything. We can even stay in a gym past three months. Shabbat shalom.